Hello, everybody. We are live. So um, I want to wait for a few people to come into the chat. Um, we're going to open this up uh, with a prayer tonight uh, because I've heard uh, there's a YouTuber who goes by the name of uh, Red Pill Rage um, that I wanted to uh, offer some prayers to. Uh, she's in the hospital unexpectedly. So, um, yeah, just wanted to open with that. So, Heavenly Father, we are gathered here and we want to offer up prayers of uh, health, support, and protection uh, to uh, the woman who does red pill rage. Um, and we just wish her a speedy recovery, not only of her body, but of her mind, heart, and spirit. Uh, she's been grievously wounded. Um, and uh, we just offer up prayers of protection. We ask that um, anything that is not of you that is in her life, uh, we ask that to be bound up and sent to the foot of Jesus. Uh, yeah, bind up um, any evil influences, any negative influences, anything that would uh, interfere with her recovery or uh, interfere with um, the trials and tribulations she's going to have going forward. We just ask, you know, armies of angels to surround and protect her, keep her safe, keep, uh, you know, help, help her heart mend, keep her heart safe, keep her soul safe. Um, and we know uh, that her body is safe now. Uh, guide the doctors with wisdom. Um, guide uh, all the other um, officials that she's going to have to deal with. Guide them with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, oh God. And uh, we, we just lift our sister up into your hands and uh, we play, pray for her speedy recovery and a speedy resolution to everything that she's dealing with. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so, yeah, um, just wanted to offer that up. And then now we're going to go to a little spiritual music by Akira the Dawn. Uh, which will help us uh, guide us through these uh, the end of the first video. We've only got a few minutes left of that. And then uh, the beginning of the second video of Jordan Peterson's Bible series. So let's do that. So there's a line in the New Testament where Christ says that no one comes to the Father except through him, which is a hell of a thing for anyone to say. I am the way and the truth and the life. That's another one. Here's the idea. It's as if there's a spirit at the bottom of things that is involved in the bringing to being of everything. People talk about evolution as a random process, but that's not true. The mutations are random, but the selection mechanisms are not random. What are the selection mechanisms? Human females are very sexually selective. That's why you have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. So the male failure rate for reproduction is twice that of the female. How is it that males succeed differentially? Females reject. They reject on the basis of what? And the answer is, well, something like competence. How is competence defined? Well, men put themselves in hierarchies and they vote on each other's competence. Let's say you decide to follow the best leader in a battle. Well, then you don't die. Like, he might get all the women, but you don't die, so at least you're still in the game. And it might be the same if you're following the greatest hunter. And the greatest hunter wouldn't be the person who was best at bringing down the game. It would be the person who was best at bringing down the game and sharing it and organizing the next hunt and all of that. What that means, to some degree, is that there's a spirit of masculinity shaping the entire structure of human evolutionary history 
That's what that means. It's the spirit of positive masculinity that manifests itself across epochal ages, millions of years perhaps. And it actually has shaped our consciousness. Actually. It's like the essential spirit of all the great men who define what greatness constitutes. That's the spirit. And that's a purely biological explanation. God. God is the highest value in the hierarchy of values. That's God. God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence and action of consciousness across time. That's God. God is that which selects among men in the eternal hierarchy of men. That's God. God is that which eternally dies and is reborn in the pursuit of higher being and truth. But then there's another possibility too, which is that that's actually reflective of a deeper metaphysical reality that has to do with the nature of consciousness itself. I think that's true, because I believe the biological case, and I believe the biologically reductive case, but I don't think that exhausts it. There's a metaphysical layer underneath that that the biology is a genuine reflection of. And that's the macrocosm above and the microcosm below. We are really reflective, including in our consciousness, of something about the structure of reality itself. And that might involve whatever it is that God is. The last God. God is the future to which we make sacrifices. God is the voice of conscience. God is the source of judgment and mercy and guilt. God is what calls and what responds in the eternal and to adventure. So that's Akira the Don, you guys. He's on YouTube, but um, he also does um, a lot of Jordan Peterson uh, Meaning Wave songs. Um, so I highly recommend uh, going to um, his channel, subscribing, and uh, also picking up his al albums through uh, the various places that you can buy his music. So. Uh, and he's absolutely wonderful, and I love that song. So uh, now we are going to get back into um, the uh, Jordan Peterson Biblical series. Let me, we're just ending up uh, the last series where we went through these ideas here. Um, yeah. The, the idea of God, you can enter into a covenant with it. It responds to sacrifice. It answers prayer. It transcends time and space. So that's why I wanted to play uh, a little bit of that music for you because, it, you know, that was an interview with uh, Dave Rubin, I believe. Um, and I think Ben Shapiro, I think that was the other guest that was on. Um, so, yeah, let's let's just jump back into it. Hey, Shaman, how you doing? Uh, and hello to everybody um, in the chat who's uh, lurking but may not comment. I'm so glad you all are here. So here we are at uh, minute 153, 10. Prayer. I'm not saying that any of this is true, by the way. I'm just saying what the, what the cloud of ideas represents. It punishes and rewards. It judges and forgives. It's not nature. You see, the thing about the thing that's one of the things that's weird about the Judeo-Christian tradition is that God and nature are not the same thing at all. Whatever God is, 
partially manifest in this logos is something that stands outside of nature. And that's, I think that's something like consciousness as abstracted from the natural world. So it built Eden for mankind and then banished us for disobedience. It's too powerful to be touched. It granted free will. Distance from it is hell. Distance from it is death. It reveals itself in dogma and in mystical experience, and it's the law. So that's sort of like the fatherly aspect. And then the sun-like aspect, it speaks chaos into order. It slays dragons and feeds people with the remains. It finds gold. It rescues virgins. It's the body and blood of Christ. It's a tragic victim and scapegoat and eternally tri triumphant redeemer simultaneously. It cares for the outcast. It dies and is reborn. It's the king of kings and hero of heroes. It's not the state, but both is both the fulfillment and critic of the state. It dwells in the perfect house. It is aiming at paradise or heaven. It can rescue from hell. It cares for the outcast. He said that twice. If you notice, it, it cares for the outcast. Hey, Lawrence, good to see you. Um, the the sun-like aspect of God cares for the outcast. He had that on the previous slide as well. And this is this is huge. Uh, you know, several places in the Bible, it talks about uh, Jesus said, I came for the sinner, not for the saved. You know, when people were trying to criticize him of, you know, why are you breaking bread and eating dinner with these, you know, prostitutes, miscreants, and all sorts of other, you know, undesirable people. Well, it's those are the people that need to be rescued. Those are the people that need to be brought to the path of righteousness and good. Um, so... I, I don't know if he noticed that he put it on two slides, but he did. <laughs> it's the foundation stone and the cornerstone that was rejected. And it's the spirit of the law. And then it's spirit-like. It's akin to the human soul. It's the prophetic voice. It's the still small voice of conscience. It's the spoken truth. It's and there's actually a name in the Jewish tradition for the still small voice. Uh, it's called the bot kol. Um, and I'll put that in the chat. And, and it's, um, it means the daughter of the voice. And that was the uh, name that Jews had for that, that smell, still small voice that you hear. Um, and, and it's not always, you know, consciousness, it's not always yourself, but just this idea that pops into your head, this voice that pops into your head and says, hey, have you thought about this? Or, you know, you need to call your mother or something like that. And, and that, that still small voice that comes from God, the Bach Cole, the daughter of the, the voice, voice with a capital V being the voice of God, you know, the voice of God in the Old Testament a lot is booming um and the the bot coal the more the more silent subtle voice uh that's that's the daughter of the big v voice and that's an aspect of god and what um a lot of christians would call the holy spirit called forth by music yes it is the enemy of deceit arrogance and resentment let me go back to um it's called forth by music there's there's a um I can't remember his name, but uh, he was a musician um, who uh, housed the Ark of the Covenant when um, King David was trying to move it. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, the, the music that, I mean, that's why we use music in our ceremonies, our, our um, spiritual ceremonies. Um, Sam, I'm, I'm doing my live right now. You know that. Um, so yeah, we, we use songs in praise and that's, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to, uh, open up with the cure of the dawns. That's God. Uh, not only because we're talking about that, but, but music is one of those interesting things. Um, uh, you know, animals respond to music, plants respond to music. Um, and it music, because it's sound, it resonates through your whole body. Um, so yeah, that, that God, uh, the spirit of God can be called forth by music is, is such a wonderful and fascinating thing. And we don't really understand how that works. You know, we don't really understand the, the psychology of music. Um, 
and and why it's so profound to us but it is and and not just to us but most living creatures so it's the water of light it burns without consuming and it's a blinding light okay so that's a very that's a very well developed poetic set of poetic metaphors essentially right so these are all what would you say glimpses of the, of the transcendent ideal that's the right way of thinking about the glimpses of the transcendent ideal and all of them have a specific meaning and well in part what we're going to do is go over that meaning as we continue with this with this series and so what we've got now is a brief description at least of what this is in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth we know it's associated with the logos in this sequence of stories we know it's associated with the word and with consciousness and we know that it's associated with whatever god is and then i laid out the, the metaphoric landscape that at least in part describes god and so now we have some sense of the being that does this creates the heavens and the earth the earth was without form and void that's that chaotic state of intermingled confusion. The darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so we'll stop with that, because now we're ready to take a tentative step into the very first part of this book. And it's important to have your conceptual framework properly organized so that you can appreciate where it's going and what it might possibly mean. And so well, I've done what I can today to, what would you say, elaborate on this single word, I suppose. And, <laughs> but it's a big word, you know, so <clears throat> it's not so unreasonable that it takes a long time to get to the point where you have any sense of what it means at all. All right. That is nowhere near, that is not, I thought I would get a lot farther. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much. All right, we're going to end this video here because he goes into the question and answer. Uh, if you want to watch the question and answer, it's at uh, minute marker one hour, 57 minutes. So now we're going to jump to the next video, which is Genesis 1, Chaos and Order. Oh, go away. Hey, Shell, good to see you. Okay, well, I thought this time that I would actually cover some of the biblical stories. <laughs> so, and hopefully a number of them. Um, as I said last time, I'm, I'm going to go through this, well, as fast as I am able to. I want to do as complete a job as possible. And, of course, the probability that I'll get through the entire Bible is very low. But we'll get through a lot of the major stories in the beginning of it, and that's a good start. And then, you know, assuming that this all goes well, then maybe I'll try to do the same thing again, either in the fall or next year. So, uh, assuming I'm, that everything is still working out properly next year, it's a long ways away. All right, so, um, I guess we'll start. So last week, I, I talked to you about a line in the New Testament that was from John, and it was a line that was designed to parallel the opening of Genesis, and it's, it's, a, it's a really important line, and I thought I would re-emphasize it, because the Bible is a book that's been written forward and backwards in time, in some sense, like most books, because if you write a book, of course, when you get to the end, if you're the writer, you can adjust the beginning and so on, so it has this odd, it has this appearance of linearity, but it really it isn't linear, it's like you're God in some sense standing outside of time, that's your book, and you can play with time anywhere along it. And uh, the people who put the book together, or the books together, uh, took full advantage of that, and, and, and that makes the story, it, it, it gives the story odd parallels in, in many, many places, in, in a very large number of places. And this is one of the major parallels, at least from the perspective of the Christian interpretation, 
of the Bible, which of course includes the New Testament. And so there's this strange idea that um, Christ was the same factor or force that God used at the beginning of time to speak habitable order into being. And that's a very, very strange idea. You know, it, it, it's, not, it's not something that can be just easily dismissed as superstition, partly because it's so strange. It's, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't even fit the definition of like a superstitious belief. It's, it's a dreamlike belief in some sense. And what I, what I see many of the ideas in, in the Bible as is, is these dreamlike ideas that, that under not lie our, our normative cognition and that constitute the ground from which our more articulate, articulated and, and explicit ideas have emerged. And this one's so complicated, this idea is so complicated that it's still mostly embedded in dreamlike form, but it seems to have something to do with the primacy of consciousness. And this is one of the biggest issues regarding the structure of reality, as far as I can tell, because everyone from physicists to neurobiologists debates this. There's, there's the, the, the stumbling block for a purely objective view of the world seems to me to be consciousness. And consciousness has all sorts of strange properties. For example, it isn't obvious what constitutes time or at least duration in the absence of consciousness. And it isn't also easy to understand what constitutes being in the absence of consciousness, because it seems to be the case. Well, if a movie is running and there's no one to watch it, I know it sounds like the tree in the forest idea, but it's, it's, it's not that idea at all. If a movie is watching, is running and no one's watching it, in what sense is, can you say that there's even a movie running? Because the movie seems to be the experience of the movie, not the objective elements of the movie. And there's something about the world at least insofar as we're in it as human beings, that is dependent on conscious experience of the world. Now, of course, you could take consciousness out of the world and say, well, if none of us were here, if there was no such thing as consciousness, then the cosmos would continue running the way it is running. But of course, it depends on what exactly you mean by the cosmos when you make a, a statement like that, because there's something about the subjective experience of reality that gives it reality or at least that's one way of looking at it. And since we're all pretty enamored of our own consciousnesses, although they're painful because they define our being, it's not unreasonable to give consciousness a kind of metaphysical primacy. Now, and it's deeper than that, you know, and it's a deeper idea than that because there are physicists, and they're not trivial physicists like, like John Wheeler, who believes that in some sense, consciousness plays a constitutive role in transforming the chaotic potential of being into the actuality of being. He, he actually thinks about it, he's not alive anymore, but he actually thought about it as, as playing a constitutive role, you know? And that is actually true. Um, we, there, I, I can't remember what it is, but there's a radioactive element that um, it, as long as it's being watched, it won't decay. But the second there isn't an observer there, it, it will decay at its normal rate. But then if you have somebody watching it, there's some sort of transfer of energy there that we don't understand where that watched element will, will freeze like an animal almost and stop decaying. So there are some really spooky things in science that exist that we don't understand where consciousness actually is and actually does interplay with reality and the the function of reality and things that go on like that. So the, the, they're absolutely spot on with that. And we, we do not understand consciousness at all. <laughs> when then from the neurobiological perspective or from the scientific perspective, it's like consciousness is not something we understand. I, I don't think we understand it at all. It's something we can't get a handle on with our fundamental materialist philosophy. And I don't know why that is. It's quite frustrating if you're a scientist, but it isn't clear to me that we've made any progress whatsoever in understanding consciousness, even though, well, we've been trying to understand it for hundreds of years. And, and even though psychologists and neurobiologists and so forth have really like put a lot of effort into understanding consciousness from a scientific perspective in the last 50 years. So anyways, what, what it's, it seems to me is the idea that that God used the word to, to extract order out of habitable order out of chaos at the beginning of time, which is roughly the right way of thinking about it, 
seems to me deeply allied with the idea that what it is that we do as human beings is, is encounter something like a formless and potential chaos. I mean, we're not omniscient, obviously, and we can't just do whatever we want, but we encounter a formless and chaotic potential. That's always what we're grappling with. And somehow we use our consciousness to give that form. And this is how people act. Like if, if, if you look at how they regard themselves, it's, it's how they act. Because you say things to people like, well, you should live up to your potential. And, and you make a case that there's something about a person that's more than what is, that yet could be if only they participated in the process properly. And everyone knows what that means. And no one acts like a mystery has been uttered when you say that. And you know, we, you can see a situation in your own life that's full of potential. You're often extremely excited when you encounter something that's full of potential because what you see is something that could be, you see a future beckoning for you that could be if only you interacted with it properly. And it activates your nervous system, right, in, in, a, in a very basic way. And we even understand how that happens to the degree that we understand how the nervous system works because the systems that mediate positive emotion, which are governed roughly by dopamine, by the neurochemical dopamine, and which have their roots way down in the ancient hypothalamus, a very, very archaic and, and fundamental part of the brain. Which we've been that reading about. responds to potential, which is the possibility of accruing something new and valuable. It responds to potential with active movement forward and engagement. And so we're engaged in the world as potential, and it looks like consciousness does that. And so there's this idea that and this is the main idea that I think is being put forth in Genesis 1. It's something like, and, and you see this in mythology, like uh, from, from what I've been able to gather, there, there's always three causal elements that make up being at the bottom of, of world mythology. And one is the formless potential that makes up being once it's interacted with, and that's generally given a feminine nature. And, and I think that's because it's like the source from which all things emerge and rise. It's something like that. It's more complicated than that, but it's something like that. And then there's some kind of interpretive structure that has to grapple with that formless potential. And that's, I think that's the sort of thing that was alluded to by Immanuel Kant when, when he was criticizing the notion that all of our information comes from sense data, which would be the pure empirical perspective, right? Because when you encounter the world, you encounter it with a cognitive structure that already has shape. And so it's, it's already in you, this structure. And Without that a priori structure, you wouldn't be able to take the formless potential and give it structure. And I think that's something, it's akin in some way to the idea of God the Father, and I'll try to develop that idea more. It's, it's, the, it's the notion that there's something in all of us that transcends all of us, that's deeply structural, that's part of this ancient, well, I would say evolutionary and cultural process, that enables us to grapple with the formless potential and bring forth reality roughly speaking. And then there's the final element, and that element seems to be something like consciousness itself, the consciousness that actually inheres in the individual. So it's not only that you have a structure, it's that the structure has the capacity for action in the world. And it's like, it's, it's, you're, the, you're the spirit that gives the dead structure life. It's something like that. And as far as I can tell, the Trinitarian notion that characterizes Christianity is something like, well, formless potential, which is never given a, the status of a deity in Christianity. And then the notion that there's an a priori interpretive structure that's a consequence of, of our ancient existence as, as beings. It goes back as, as far in time as you can go, the, the notion of a structure. And then the idea of a consciousness that that is the, is the tool of that structure and that interacts with the world and gives it and gives it reality. And that's the word, as far as I can tell. And so the notion is, is that there's a father, and that's the structure, and there's a son that's transcendent, that characterizes consciousness itself, and that it's the son, the, the speaking of the son, that is the active principle that turns chaos into order. And God, that's such a sophisticated idea, as, as, as far as I'm concerned, because, well, there's something about it that's at least phenomenologically accurate, because you do have an interpretive structure, and you couldn't understand anything without it. Your very body is an interpretive structure, right? It's been crafted over, let's say, three billion years of evolution. Without that, you wouldn't be able to perceive anything. And it's taken a lot of death and struggle and tragedy to produce you, the thing that's capable of encountering this immense chaos that surrounds us, and to transform it into habitable order. And 
Then there's the idea, too, of course, that's deeply embedded in the first chapters of Genesis, which is a staggering idea, you know, and, and certainly not one that's likely that human beings were made in the image of God, both male and female were made in the image of God. And that's, of course, a very difficult thing to understand, partly because the God that's referred to in, the, in those chapters has a kind of polytheistic element, um, although it's an element that's moving rapidly towards a unified monotheism. But it's not also obvious to me why people would come up with that concept, because I don't really think that when we think about each other, we immediately think God-like. You know, <laughs> the notion that every single human being regardless of their peculiarities and strangenesses and sins and crimes and all of that, has something divine in them that needs to be regarded with respect and that plays an integral role, at least an, analog an analogous role, in the creation of habitable order out of chaos. That's a magnificent, remarkable, crazy idea. And yet we developed it, and I do firmly believe that it sits at the base of our legal system. I think it is the cornerstone of our legal system. It absolutely is. Um, the whole idea of um, innocent until proven guilty uh, you know, comes from this idea that, that each of us you know, is a, a, an image of God, that we are made in God's image. And therefore, you know, mo no matter what the alleged crime is, you, know, you have to prove that a crime was committed. And before that, you you respect, you know that that um, this person is, you know, in God's image, and, and we need to deal with things forthrightly. We need to, you know, do a rule of law situation, and that also comes from Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, of um, the idea of you know just just ten righteous people. If you can just find me ten righteous people, I will spare the city. Um, so. You know, all of this is absolutely profoundly at the base of our legal system. You know, God-given rights, uh, you know, the right to liberty, the right um, to happiness, uh, the right to uh, speech. You know, the, this, this all comes from the Judeo-Christian value system and, and what they and how they perceived and how they wrote yeah, the Bible. So uh, he's spot on with that. That's the, the notion that everyone is equal before God, which is, of course, a completely, yep. that's such a strange idea. It's very difficult to understand how anybody could have ever come up with that idea because the manifold differences between people are so, so obvious and so evident that you could say the natural way of viewing someone is, or, or human beings is in this extremely hierarchical manner where some people are contemptible and, and, and easily brushed off as, as pointless and pathological and, and without value whatsoever. And all the power accrues to a certain tiny, you know, aristocratic minority at the top. But if you look at the way that the idea of the in individual sovereignty developed, it's clear that it unfolded over thousands and perhaps 10,000s of years before it became something firmly fixed in the imagination that each individual had something of transcendent value about them. And man, I tell you, we dispense with that idea at our serious peril. Yes. And so, and if you're going to take that idea seriously, then, which you do, because you act it out, because otherwise you wouldn't be law-abiding citizens, right? You act that idea out. It's, 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 it's firmly shared by, by everyone who, who acts in a civilized manner. The question is, why in the world do you believe it, assuming that you believe what you act out, which I think is a really good way of fundamentally defining belief. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So, so that's the sort of idea is that there's this, this God of tradition and structure. That's, that's God, the father who uses the son, which is more of an active force and, and, and primarily something that's verbal, which I also think is extremely interesting because it's associated not with thought precisely, but with speech. And I think the reason for that is, is that, there's something to speech that's more than mere thought. And I yes. think part of the reason for that is that speech is a public utterance. Yes. And at least in, in principle, speech is something that's shaped by the existence of, of everywhere, of everyone else, at yes. least across time. Because when you speak, you, you your speech is, is put forward in the world as a causal element. And it's also subject to criticism and, 
and, uh, and cooperation and, and mutual shaping. And so th there's an idea here too that speech is, that, that the cognitive processes that bring habitable reality out of, out of uninhabitable chaos have this collective and public element, which, which is part of the reason, by the way, that I'm an advocate of free speech, let's say above all, because I, I don't think, although it is the case, for example, in the Canadian Bill of Rights, that every single right has equal value. That's the theory. It's an idiotic theory because it's absolutely impossible for a large set of rights to have absolutely equal standards and stances. That cannot happen. There's no way that that can ever work. But that is the legal judgment. But I think it's a huge mistake because free speech has this, well, this divine quality, let's say, that you can't escape from because it's the thing that manufactures everything else. You know, it's and yes. so, and I do think that the the, the dream that you could think of as encapsulated in the stories in Genesis is, is the dream by which human beings dreamed up the idea that we would now consider consciousness because, you know, it took us a long time to figure out the word consciousness. It's not like it's bloody obvious. It, who knows how many thousands of years or, or, or who knows what struggles we had to undertake to abstract out something like consciousness and how we had to represent that dramatically, say, or symbolically, or in a dreamlike fashion before we could actually formulate the term and, and localize that to some degree in people. It's very sophisticated. So, so John makes the case that, well, there's, there's an emanation of God or an element of God, the, the transcendent consciousness, it's something like that, that acts directly and in, in a sort of living way with the with the underlying potential of the world. And I think that that's phenomenologically accurate. And I do think that that's the way we regard our lives because, you know, when you think about it too, we tend to think that what you encounter when you're looking at the world is the material world, but that isn't how you act. You do act as if you're in a place of potential and also in a place of potential that you can actually transform, which is also something extraordinarily strange, you know, because we do treat each other as if we're capable of bringing new forms into the world in some permanent manner, right? And, and we treat each other as if we have free choice and free will, and perhaps we don't, but it's certainly the case that societies that are predicated on the idea that we don't, don't do very well. And societies that are predicated on the idea that we do seem to do a lot better. Plus, people tend to get very annoyed at you if you treat them like they're automatons that lack free will. There's something that people find very I would say constraining, slave-like about that. Even, yes, you know that the, the demand that you don't have actual autonomy, and even worse, that you're not responsible for your choices. It's an insult to someone to suggest to them that they're not responsible for their choices. You know, you, you usually to do that to someone from a legal perspective, you have to argue something like diminished capacity, right? Well, you're mentally ill, or you don't have the intellectual capacity, or or, or you were, or you were addled by some substance, or you had a brain injury, or something, and that's why you're not responsible for your actions. Otherwise, part of the respect that you give to another human being is the assumption that they're responsible for their actions. And some of that can be, well, if you do something bad, then you're responsible for it. But part of that too is that if you do something good, you're also responsible for that. And that also seems necessary because, I mean, do you really? I mean, it's got to be more annoying than, than anything else you can imagine to strive virtuously, let's say, to produce something of extreme value and then to be treated as if that was a mere deterministic outcome and that your your actual choices have nothing to do with that. I mean, people right. find that sort of thing extraordinarily punishing. And so I'm willing to, you know, I mean, I know that there are debates about all these things and debates about free will and debates about the nature of consciousness, but I'm trying to take a clear view, look at how people act and how they want to be treated, and then to trace it back to these old ideas to see if there's some, if there's some metaphysical, let's say, metaphysical connection. So, And um, just pausing on that briefly, uh, hey, Sam, welcome. Um, the, uh, oh gosh, what was I going to say? Oh, um, there's the idea uh, that, you know, we all have free will and, um, you know, talking about the, the 
difference between determinism and the, the free will philosophies. Um, you know, predetermination says that you have no control over anything. And free will says that you have control um, over almost everything or most things, that kind of thing. And what actually works is that, you know, it's the combination of the two where uh, like predetermination is the cards you are dealt and free will is how you play them. So, and uh, that's the idea that I favor the most. All right. So here's how the, here's how the book opens. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, this is a hard, this is a hard, uh, what would you call narrative section to, to get a handle on, because in order to understand it properly, you have to actually look behind it. So there, there are a lot of pieces of old stories in the Old Testament that flesh out the meaning of these lines. And, and I, can, I can give you a quick overview of it. One of the ideas that lurks underneath these lines, although you can't tell because it's in English, you have to look at the original languages. And of course, I don't speak the original languages, so I've had to use secondary sources. Too, too bad for me. But the 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 uh, without form and void and the deep idea, you see, that's associated with this notion of endless deep potential. So, for example, the words that are used to represent without form and void, are something like, well, one is to, I'm going to get this partly wrong, tohu wa bohu, and another one is teo, and it's important to know this because those words are associated with an early Mes earlier Mesopotamian word, which is tiamat, and tiamat was a dragon-like creature who represented the salt water, and, and tiamat had a husband named Apsu, and tiamat and Apsu were sort of locked together in kind of a sexual embrace, and it was that locking together of Tiamat and Apsu, and I would say that's potential and order, something like that, or chaos and order. They were locked together, and it was that union of chaos and order that gave rise in the old Mesopotamian myth, which is the Enuma Elish, to the to the to being, to the old gods first, and then eventually, as as creation progressed, to human beings themselves. And so there's this idea lurking underneath this these initial lines that God is akin to that which confronts the unknown and carves it into pieces and makes the world out of its pieces. And the thing that it confronts is something like a, well, it's something like a predatory reptile or it's something like a dragon or it's something like a serpent. And I think part of the reason for that, and, and this, this, is, this is a very deep and ancient idea, is that this is where it gets so complicated to do the translation, is partly... That is how human beings created our world. Like we went out beyond the confines of our safe spaces, let's say, our space, <laughs> our safe spaces defined by the tree or defined by the fire. And we actively voyaged outward to the places that we were afraid of and didn't understand and, 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 con and, and conquered and encountered things out there, like, like, an, like literally animals, like mammoths and snakes and predators of all sorts. And it was a, as a consequence of that active, brave engagement with the domain of what we did not understand, the terrifying domain of what we did not understand, that the world, in fact, was generated. And that idea lurks deeply inside the, the opening lines of, of Genesis. And it's, a, and it's a profound idea, in my estimation. And I think, see, I think also that the way our brains are structured, and this is something that I'm going to try to develop more today, is that the ancient circuits that our ancestors used to deal with the space beyond which they had already explored. So that would be home territory. That, so that's that unknown territory that's, that's characterized by promise because there are new things out there, but also by intense danger, right? And you see that um, on ancient maps um, where they talk about here there be dragons, the part of the map that they hadn't explored, you know, going up, you know, right up into the age of the Enlightenment. You know, that if, if the, the part of the map hadn't been explored yet, they put here they'd be dragons. Um, and it's it's that idea of the danger and the potential and everything like that. And what's interesting is, is every culture has a, a dragon 
uh, myth in it. And there's another interview that I'm going to cover with this that uh, Jordan Peterson did while he was doing these series um, that the uh, dragon is actually a combination of the three predators that we had as lower primates. And that is the, the snake, obviously, because dragons are scaly uh, and they have a tail. Um, but also uh, dragons have wings. Um, so that's the bird, the predatory bird. And, uh, but the dragon has feet. Uh, and so it's a cat snake bird. Uh, and those, those three animals, those three predatory animals were the animals that we feared as lower primates. Um, and so you put them in, in combination, the cat snake bird, and then also fire, you know, because that could destroy your habitat, uh, and all your food and everything else. So, you know, a dragon, a fire breathing dragon being the amalgamation of all the things that could destroy us. So, um, Samantha P says, uh, Abzu and Tiamat, I've read the story so many times. I literally was reading the tablets of Aniki just like three hours ago. I, I don't, I don't know. I think that's reptiles on the planet. Um, well, it may be, um, but for the, the idea of, of, you know, dragons, which don't, I mean, we were not around in the time of dinosaurs. So where did we get this idea of, of the dragon being the monster? And so Jordan Peterson believes and there's some evolutionary psychologist woman who worked on this and and that 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 monster the cat snake bird fire breathing cat snake bird the dragon that's that's why we have it and that's why all cultures have the dragon um so i i just i'll try and find those um videos for for next time uh after we get through this so but I, I love this background stuff that he, he provides. Because we're prey animals, especially millions of years ago when we were very young, we had to go out there and encounter things that were terribly dangerous. And there was a kind of, let's say, paternal courage that went along with that. And it was that the spirit of paternal courage that enabled the conquering of the unknown. And there's no difference between the conquering of the unknown and the creation of habitable, habitable order. And the thing is, is that as our cognitive faculties have developed to the point where we're, we're capable of very high levels of abstraction, the underlying biological architecture has remained the same. And so I, I don't think that it's too much to say at all that the, the circuits that you, that engage you, for example, when you're having an argument about something fundamental with someone that you love, and so you're trying to structure the world around you jointly to create a habitable space that you can both exist within, you're using the same circuits, the abstracted version, you're using the same circuits that our archaic ancestors would have used when they went out into the unknown itself to encounter beasts and, and, and predators and, and, and geographical unknowns. It's the same circuit. It's just that we do it abstractly now instead of concretely. But of course it has to be the same circuit because evolutionary, evolutionary is, is a very conservative force. And what else would it be? And this is also why I think it's so easy for us to demonize those people who are our enemies, because our enemies confront us with what we don't want to, with what we don't want to see. And they, they, and because of that, our first response is to use snake circuitry, snake detection circuitry on them, and that accounts for our capacity, almost immediate capacity, to demonize. And, and, and there's a reason for that. It's not a trivial thing. First of all, it's a very fast response. And second of all, it's a response that has worked for a very, very, very long time. And so, you know, one of the variants of the hero, and, and I would consider a variant of the hero, uh, like a fragment of the picture of God, is, is the heroic warrior who slays the enemy, right? And of course, that's not precisely a politically correct representation of the hero in modern times. And, well, and no wonder, but it's still something that you go watch in movies all the time and admire, right? It's, it's like this one of the most, how many plots are there? Romance and adventure, that's about it. And most of the adventure uh, genre is, well, there's some enemy that's lurking in some form. It could be human, it could be alien, and someone rises up to go and confront it and maintain order. You know, it's like there's no getting away from that story. 
And, and if you don't have that in your own life, then you, you play a video game where that's happening, or you watch a movie where that's happening, or you read a book where that's happening, and it captures you, even if you're atheistic and your only religion is Star Wars, you know? And it's still, well, really, really, right? It, it, it really, it still captures your imagination, and you act like someone who's possessed by religious fervor when you line up for three days to be the first one into the theater, you know? Yeah. And all the while yep. claiming that you're atheistic to the core. So. <laughs> Okay, so this, this without form and void is this chaotic, and it's, a, it's, a hard thing to, it's a hard thing to get a grip on, you know, what exactly this means. But I can give you a, another kind of example of how you would experience the formless chaos of potential in your own lives, and, and even how the order that you currently inhabit can dissolve into that. And, you know, in Dante's um, Inferno, when he outlined the levels of hell, so Dante was trying to get to the bottom of what constituted evil, really, in, in, in this representation. So it's a work of psychology, and he was thinking, well, there, there are various ways to behave reprehensibly, but there's a hierarchy of re reprehensible behavior, and there's something absolutely the worst at the bottom. And, and, and Dante believed that it was betrayal. And, and I think that's right, because, yes. you know, one of the things that enables... Uh, long-term cooperation, peaceful cooperation between people is trust. And I would also say that trust is the fundamental natural resource. So there's been some very good books written on the economic utility of trust, for example, and societies where the default economic presupposition between trading partners is trust tend to be rich, even if they don't have any natural resources. And you can see that, for example, with what happened with eBay, which I think was a kind of miracle because what should have happened with eBay was that you sent me junk and I sent you a check that bounced, right? And, and that was the end of eBay. But, right, right, exactly. But that isn't what happened. Like the default, the default transaction on eBay was so honest that the brokers, you, you could hire brokers to begin with. I, I can't remember what they were called exactly, but you could pay someone a fee so that they would guarantee the transaction. So. You know, you wouldn't send me junk and I'd actually send you a payment and we'd pay 10% for someone to guarantee that. The default trade was so honest that those things vanished right away. Yep. And so that meant that all this frozen capital, roughly speaking, which were all the junk that people had lying around that someone else might want, instantly became money. And the only reason that worked was because people trusted one another. And so trust is, is, is an unbelievably powerful economic force, maybe the most powerful economic force. Yes. Anyways... If you have a relationship with someone, it's predicated on trust. And part of the reason for that is that trust is what enables us to look at each other without running away screaming. And <laughs> what I mean by that is that if I trust you, then I don't have to take into account how complicated you are because you're horribly complicated. You know, I think chimpanzee full of snakes, that's what a human being is. And, and as long as you'll do what you say you'll do, then that's I can the take you at your word and your word simplifies you and you can take me at my word and my word simplifies you. And then we can act like we understand each other, even though we don't. That's going back to word being what brings order out of chaos. You know, if you can trust what I say and I can trust what you say, the complicated universe, that is me. You can make order out of the complicated universe. That is you. I can make order out of. Oh, great. Sam, thanks for the link. Um, this is, uh, um, photos, um, of, uh, flying reptiles, I think, or is that the, the link for, um, the, uh, Tiamat and Abzu? So either way, thank you for the link, Samantha. I appreciate it. Um, Oh, there's a civil war one. That's interesting. So yeah, but, but even still, even if there were flying lizards in the United States frontier, it doesn't explain why that idea of the dragon exists in all cultures around the world. You know, the, the Mayans had it um, with Quetzalcoatl, the, the, the flying snake deity. And, you know, the, the Asians have it and everybody has the idea of the, the dragon and that's um that tells you that it's a, a human notion 
It's not, you know, some animal we had to encounter because there's no way that those tales would be spread through the entire world at that time when, you know, the myths that included dragons existed. Um, but, you know, this whole thing about, um, you know, words being how we can uncomplicate each other, uh, you know, the chaos that is you, the chaos that is me, you know, those things are resolved through words, uh, just like, you know, God spoke being um, out of, you know, out of the, the, the chaos uh, that existed. So, and I, and I don't think Jordan touches on that, but I, it's, it's definitely a connection that's there. But then if that trust is betrayed, then all the snakes come forth very, very rapidly. And so you, you, all of you, I suspect, have been betrayed one way or another. And so what happens if, if you're in a relationship with someone and you trust them, then you make certain assumptions about the past and you make certain assumptions about the present and you make certain assumptions about the future and everything's stable. And so you're standing on solid ground and, and the chaos, it's like you're standing on thin ice. The chaos is hidden. The, the shark beneath the waves isn't there. You're, you're safe. You're in the lifeboat. But then if the person betrays you, like if you're in an intimate relationship and the person has an affair and you find out about it, then, then you think one moment you're one place, right? You're, you're where everything is secure because you predicated your perception of the world on the axiom of trust. And the next second, really, the next second, you're in a completely different place. And not only is that place different right now, the place you were years ago is different and the place you're gonna be in the future years hence is different. And so all of that certainty, that strange certainty that you inhabit can collapse into incredible complexity. And you say, well, if someone betrays you, you think, well, okay, who were you? because you weren't who I thought you were, and yep. I thought I knew you, but I didn't know you at all, and I never knew you, and so all the things we did together, those weren't the things that I thought were happening. Something else was happening, and you are you were someone else, and that means I'm someone else because I thought I knew what was going on, and clearly I don't. I'm some sort of blind sucker or the, or the victim of a psychopath or someone who's so naive that they can barely live, but I don't understand anything about human beings, and I don't understand anything about myself, um, Billy Joel, uh, the strong, the song, the stranger, uh, really, really gets into this. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, the, the whole idea of, of the strength, somebody that you thought you knew suddenly becoming a stranger hitting you right between the eyes. Um, and you know, the, the idea of between the eyes, you know, with the third eye, the, the eye that comprehends, um, and, and all of that being blown to bits, um, is, is go listen to that song after this. It's fantastic. So if you don't know it already. <laughs> and I have no idea where I am now. I thought it was at home, but I'm not. I'm in a house and it's full of strangers and I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow or next week or next year. It's like all of that certainty, that habitable certainty collapses mm. right back into the potential from which it emerged. And that's a terrifying thing. That's a journey to the underworld from a mythological perspective. And that is really something worth knowing because, you know, journeys to the underworld are extraordinarily common in mythological stories. And, you know, like the Hobbit going out to find the smog, the, the dragon, and, and get the gold is a journey into the underworld. And journeys to the underworld happen all the time. And modern people don't understand what the underworld is, except that we've all been there. And we go there <laughs> all the time. And we go there every time the solidity and stability of the world that we've erected at least partly through our speech is shattered because while well, some sort of snake appears that's another way of thinking about it and it's a really good way of thinking about it because you know no matter how carefully you construct the little habitable area that's around you there's always something you didn't take into account and there's always something that can pop up its head and do you in and yep. make you aware of your mortality and, and age you for that matter or even kill you Yep. And that's the permanent that's the permanent situation of life, which is part of the reason why I think the story of Adam and Eve, for example, is archetypal. It's because we do inhabit walled gardens, right? Because a walled garden is half structure, society, and half nature. That's what a walled garden is. And a walled garden is a place of, 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 of paradise and warmth and 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 and, and love and and Freedom and sustenance, but it's also the place where 
something can pop up at any moment and knock you out of it. And I think part of the reason that that story exists at the beginning of this collection of books is because it explains the eternal situation of human beings. Yes. We're always in that situation. Yes. We're in a walled garden, or we bloody well hope we are. But there's always a snake. And then it's even worse because if there is a snake, we're exactly the sort of creatures who are going to do nothing but go and interact with that snake the second that we can manage it. You know, it's it's definitely the case that if you want a human being to muck around with something, the best thing to do is to tell them not ever to do it, have anything to do with it. Because, of course, <laughs> something you know if you have teenagers. Or <laughs> don't press the shiny red candy like button. <laughs> You know, it's, don't do that. Oh, really? Really? You don't want me to do that? Uh, watch me. <laughs> or even children, or or if you know anything about yourself or your partner. So these stories are trying to express what you might describe as an unchanging, transcendent reality. You know, it's it's something like what's common across all human experience across all time, and that's what Jung essentially meant by an archetype. And you could say, well, you know, we tend to think that what we see with our senses is real. And of course that's true, but what we see with our senses is what's real that works at the time frame that we exist in, right? And so we see things that we can touch and pick up. We see tools, essentially, that are useful for our moment-to-moment -moment activities. We don't see the structures of eternity, especially not the abstract structures of eternity. We have to imagine those with our imagination. Yeah. Well, and that's partly what these stories are doing. They're saying, well, there's, there's forms of stability that transcend our capacity to observe, which is hardly surprising. We know that if we're scientists, right? Because we're always abstracting out things that we can't immediately observe. But there are metaphysical or moral realities or phenomenological realities that have the same nature that you can't see them in your life by, by observing them with your senses but you can imagine them with your imagination and though sometimes the things that you imagine with your imagination are more real than the things that you see the numbers are like that for example I mean, there's, there's endless examples of that and i would say well this is also a good way of thinking about fiction because a good work of fiction is more real than the stories from which it was derived. Otherwise, it has no staying power, right? It's distilled reality, even though in some sense it never happened. It's like, well, it depends on what you mean by happened. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a pattern that repeats in many, many places with variation. You extract out the central pattern. It's, it's the pattern purely never existed in any specific form but the fact that you've pulled a pattern out from all those exemplars means that you've extracted something real. And I think the reason that the, the story of Adam and Eve, which we'll talk about in quite a bit of detail today, has, has been immune to being forgotten is because it says things about the nature of the human condition that are always true. Yep. I can give you another brief example. You know, like people have a lot of guilt. You know, there, there's a line of social psychology that claims that most people feel that they're better than other people. And like, I just don't buy that. That isn't what I've seen in my life. And maybe it's I'm a bit biased because I'm a clinical psychologist and I see more people who are overtly suffering, maybe, than people do in general. Although I'm not so sure about that, you know, because you don't have to scratch very far beneath the surface of most people's lives before you find something truly tragic. Yep. And I don't mean the sort of tragedy that, that you whine about. I mean, you know, your mother has Alzheimer's or, or your, your best friend committed suicide or you have a close relative with cancer, you have a sick child or, you know, there's something wrong with you because almost everyone has at least one really terrible thing wrong with them. And if you don't, hey, you will. So, you know, <laughs> so, you know, that, that, so, so that, that, that tragic sense of being is there with people all the time. And, and, and it's also the case that my, in my experience, like I rarely meet someone who says, hey, you know, I'm doing everything I possibly can. I'm a hell of a guy, and I can't see how I could possibly improve. You know, you, you, meet, you meet someone like that, you think they're narcissistic, right? And you're right. And <laughs> most people don't feel that way. They feel like they could do a hell of a lot better than they are, and they're quite acutely aware of their faults, and they don't feel that they're what they should be. Yep. And you see what happens in the story of Adam and Eve as well as that when people become self-conscious, at least that's how it looks to me, they get thrown out of paradise and then they're in history and history is a place where there's pain in childbirth and where 
you're dominated by your mate and where you have to coil like mad, like no other animal because you're aware of the future. You have to work and sacrifice the joys of the present for the future constantly and you know you're going to die and you have all that weight on you. And to me, again, that's just, how can anything be more true than that? That's yeah. just, as far as I can tell, that's just how it is. For Unless you're naive beyond comprehension, there's something about your life that 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 is echoed in, in that representation and why it is. That, I mean, we're such strange creatures because we don't seem to really fit into being in some sense. And that's also what's expressed in the notion of the fall. We, the existentialists said, well, people feel like they have a, a debt that they have to pay off to existence for the for the crime of their for the crime of their being, yep. something like that. And, and maybe it's because we're acutely aware that we have to offer something of value to the people around us so that they can tolerate us you know, while we're, we're going about our business. But it seems deeper than that is that human beings seem to exist. Oh, it, it, I'll let him finish that. Human beings seem to exist. Post-cataclysmic world. And that's exactly also what's represented in Genesis. It's very interesting because, you know, there's, in the Adam and Eve story, there's two there's two catastrophes essentially. There's the catastrophe that occurs when Adam and Eve wake up, which we'll talk about in detail, and become self-conscious and, and know that they're naked. That and, and, and their eyes are open, right? So that's the terminology that's used. And to have your eyes open means to have a, an increment in consciousness, essentially, because eyes are associated with consciousness for human beings because we're intensely visual animals. And so the metaphor of having your eyes open means it's the same as the metaphor of coming to consciousness. And as soon as Adam and Eve come to consciousness, they realize they're naked. And, you know, the classic interpretation of that is that it has something to do with sexual sin. And I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I, I, I don't believe that that's what it means. Although, And, and I agree with him here. Um, I wanted to go back to, you know, the idea that, that we all feel like we're lacking something and we need to provide value to those people around us. This is something that happens all the time with people who are disabled with a chronic illness or with chronic pain is that um, you, you feel like a burden, you know, that, that you, know, you, you should be doing something for other people. You should be, you know, um, uh, being productive and you can't. Um, this, this goes back to the, the whole idea that I had. There's a, a saying in Al-Anon, you know, I'm a human being, not a human doing. But if you take doing away from somebody, you realize how important and how fundamental the ability to do is part of your life. We really are human doings as well as human beings. Um, so it's, it's not like you can enter this Zen place where you don't do anything and, and, you know, you, you feel like you have value. Um, you know, being a human being is like, yeah. And what else, you know? So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, we, we do all feel we have a debt to life itself. And, and when you take that away, it's, it's very hard on people. Um, it's catastrophic. It can send you in a, into a deep, deep depression if you aren't able to do, or if you aren't able to do reliably. Um, you know, if people struggle with that a lot, a lot, a lot. So, there are elements about that that are relevant. It's more that to realize that you're naked. It's like you're, you know, if, if you dream that you're naked and on a stage in front of people, that's not a sexual dream, man, unless you're some kind of strange exhibitionist, right? <laughs> if you want to cover yourself up and get the hell off that stage as fast as possible. And so to be naked in front of a crowd is to have everyone, it's to have the judgment of the social world focused on your self-evident inadequacies. And that makes people self-conscious. And that, that's a real human state. It's associated with neuroticism in, in the big five trait model. But people don't like that at all. They don't like having their fragility and vulnerability exposed to the group. It's one of the two major fears of people. Because one is social humiliation. Yep. And the other is something like mortality and death. And the, your, your typical agoraphobic, for example, gets to have both those fears at the same time. Because she, it's usually a she, tends to believe she's going to have a very spectacular and exhibitionistic heart attack in a public place and make a terrible fool of herself while she's dying. <laughs> so, and then that's a good example of, of the two archetypal fears that characterize, characterize human beings. 
I love that. I love that. So, so to me, and I said that I tried to approach these stories as if I didn't know what they were about, because that seemed right to me, because they're mysteries. They're, everything about them is mysterious. And why we have them is mysterious. And what the hell you're all doing here is mysterious, you know, listening to this lecture. And so, and reading Jung, because Jung, Carl Jung was very, very helpful in this because he, he faced these stories with a beginner's mind and presumed there was something to him that he didn't understand, given that they were at the very bloody bottom of our civilization. Yes. You know, which is historically perfectly clear. And that they came out of the midst of time. And he wasn't satisfied with the idea, the, the Freudian idea that God was just the father or the Marxist idea that religion was the opiate of the masses. It's like if religion was the opiate of, of the masses, then um, communism was the methamphetamine of the masses. I can tell you that. <laughs> so, so, you know, you've been betrayed by someone. And so you fall into that underworld of, of, of doubt about everything. And it's a serious place to be in that underworld, eh? because not only do you not know where you came from or who you are or where you're going, that's bad enough. So that's the underworld itself. But there's a subdivision of the underworld, like the worst suburb, which is, I think, what hell is, essentially, from a metaphysical perspective. Because, you know, if someone really cuts you off at the knees, especially if they do it in a malevolent way, and, and if you're going to be betrayed and you really want to be betrayed properly, you want to be betrayed by someone who's really out to hurt you. You know, they just weren't being stupid. They were, like, after you for whatever reason. And then that's also, you plunge into that underworld space, and that's also when you start to nurse feelings of resentment and aggrievement and murder and homicide, and even worse, you know, because if people are betrayed enough, they start, they start to obsess about the utility of being itself and perhaps go to places that no one would ever want to go if they were in the right mind and to, and to develop and nurse fantasies of the ultimate revenge. And that's a horrible place to be, and that's hell as far as I can tell. And, that's why hell has always been a suburb of the underworld, because if if you get plunged into a situation that you don't understand and things are not good for you anymore, it's one step from being completely confused. It's only one step from being completely confused to being completely outraged yeah. and resentful. And then it's only one step from there to really looking for revenge. And yeah. that can take you places that, well, that, that merely to imagine properly can be traumatic. And I've seen that happen with people many times. Yeah. And, I think that anybody who uses their imagination on themselves can see how that happens because I don't imagine there's a single person in the room that hasn't nursed fairly intense fantasies of revenge, at least at one point in their life. And yes. usually, you know, for what appear to be good reasons, it's no picnic to get betrayed, that's for sure, and it can shake your faith in being, but it, if it shakes it so badly that you turn against being itself, that's certainly no solution. That's for sure. All it does is make everything that's bad even worse. Yes. So. Okay. Now, so, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. And so that's, that's another, that's another fundamental separation, right? Light and darkness. Those are those are, in some sense, the two fundamental, two of the fundamental elements of our conscious being. Because, of course, when, when it's light, we're awake and conscious because we're diurnal animals. And when it's night, well, then we're asleep. And so our, our, our existence is bounded by light and darkness. We're, we're up and alert when it's light. And that's partly because we're highly visual animals, right? Unlike most animals, because most animals use smell. We, we use vision. We're very strange that way. And vision is associated with enlightenment and illumination and with the breaking of the dawn and with the coming of the new day and, and all of that. So and so for, for light to be created is 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 associated in some sense with the emergence of conscious being. And so that's another echo of that notion. And there the the particular phrasing of the of the story also is important because it's again that God said, right? So that's the use of that word, and that's the active element of the structure that gives rise to, that gives order to chaos. It's something like that. So it's this, it's like the spirit of the structure manifests itself and, and produces the fundamental divisions of experience. That's what's being presented here. And God separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day and the darkness he called night. And again, again, the fact that things are named is also very important. 
So you see this later with Adam because God gives Adam the job of naming all the animals. And it's sort of like the animals don't actually exist in some sense till they're named. And that's, that's another indication of the authors of the Bible's attempt to come to terms with the fact that our cognitive faculties and our ability to speak have something to do with the way that we cast chaotic potential into actuality, right? Because we can't, we can't really get a grip on something before we have a name for it, which is why, for example, you all have names. And, and that's true in science too. Um, you know, we can't get a grip on, we, we don't even know a species exists until, you know, we separate it out from the other species and give it a name. Um, we don't really know that uh, physical forces like like quarks and stuff like that. You know, when, when I was being raised in, and taught science in school, you know, you had the atom, you had the, the electron, the proton and the neutron. Um, and, and that was all there was. And it wasn't until, you know, we made this new discovery and gave it a name, quarks, that these other forces come into play and we got a... a, a better grip on reality as it were so the 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 naming of things is actually fundamental it's 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 not something that's that's just a game or something like that it, it's it's fundamental to our knowing our understanding and our ability to cope with things everything that you encounter has to have a name because before it has a name, it's just kind of part of the blurry background. It's something like that. It's, you could say it exists before it has a name, but and that's true. But it's also true that it doesn't exist before it has a name. Yep. Because as soon as you give something a name, its nature changes, and you've transformed it into something that's not so much mere potential anymore, but it's at least on its way to being actuality. It's on its way to being a tool. And so the, the act of naming is repeated continually in the first chapters of the Bible, and the reason for that is this continued emphasis on the importance of consciousness and conscious articulation and speech. Yep. You know, and speech is really something that does separate us in an important way from animals, you know, like, we, we haven't got very far teaching animals how to speak. The best we've managed so far is some parrots, right? There's a gray African parrot, there was one of them that got up to about a four-year-old level, and that's mind-boggling, because like, how big is the brain of a parrot? It's like that big, and that bloody thing can talk, and so that shows you how much we know about brains. But I know they're small and all that. But and we tried teaching chimpanzees to talk, and they could kind of get somewhere with sign language, especially if you started when they were young. But they don't have the capacity for language like we do, and they were never able to really pass it on to the to the next generation, which is obviously a critical element of really having that ability. Yeah. So human beings. We, we, we've used our linguistic capacity to parse up the world in a new way and to conceptualize it in a new way. And, you know, you can say that we're just like ants on this little trivial planet out on the edge of, of one of 100 million galaxies and that what's happening here has no cosmic significance. But that's an arbitrary, that's an arbitrary uh, proposition, you know yep. I mean? We're very complicated things, and, and whatever's going on on this planet has to do with conscious reality. And the transformations of consciousness, for all we know, might be the most important things that happen everywhere. Yep. There, there's no reason to consider consciousness a trivial phenomenon. I mean, it's taken three and a half billion years for you to develop the brain that you've developed. And, you, and human beings are amazing creatures. I mean, just a casual walk through YouTube and all those crazy kids that climb cranes and do that. What's that? That... Yeah, parkour, man, that stuff's unbelievable, you know? I mean, human beings are crazy, crazy animals. There's almost nothing we can't do. And I'm very loath to assume that the transformations of consciousness that are described in the early, in the early stories in, in the biblical accounts are somehow cosmically trivial. It, it doesn't strike me that way, and it's certainly not self-evident. Even if they are cosmically trivial, whatever that means, the rocks don't care what you think. Well, who cares what the rocks think? First, they don't think. So I don't see why that's exactly relevant. But even if even if it's all the same to the cosmos, which is something that I doubt, it's certainly not just all the same to you, you know, because your consciousness has a quality and it matters. The Heidegger, for example, who's, who's a philosopher who, who's writing, sort of influenced me post hoc because I recreated some of the things that he had talked about in the 30s before I knew much about him. But 
one of the things that Heidegger said was that the fundamental element of human being, of human phenomenology, was care. He said that that's the basic essence of your being, is that you care about things. You know, and, that, and that's either negatively or positively, right? You, to not care about something or to hate it is still to be involved in care. Yes. And so even if the cosmos itself is is neutral with regards to our existence, we're not, and we're the only things that we know of that are conscious, <laughs> and so, well, we might as well go with that, and there's no yes. reason. See, I can't help but think that the constant attempts by people to trivialize the nature of their own consciousness has a has a dark side. I'm a, I'm a psychoanalyst, and so I always think that way. It's like, well, first of all, if you're if you as a being don't matter, then you don't have to do anything. It's a great justification for total lack of responsibility, and that that really twigs something for me because you know people who are bent, let's say, or vengeful or angry are always looking for a reason why they don't have to be responsible for anything. Plus, plus it's a lot easier. And so the notion that consciousness is trivial immediately allows you to wander down that path. And so I'm skeptical of those claims. And I also think that there's a deep hatred of humanity that underlies those claims as well. And I read my YouTube comments sometimes. You know, and I've always been, I've always been annoyed <laughs> that, you know, because I've heard like sort of radical, clueless environmentalists say things like planet would be better off without people on it, which is something that like you just cannot say that. that if you say that and listen to yourself, you should like go to a monastery for like three years and never say a word and have a shower every 10 minutes until you've learned your lesson properly. You, know, <laughs> you can't utter a more genocidal phrase than that, you know. And of course, you always do yes. it in, 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 a, in a display of your care for the world. It's like, well, if we just didn't have any people, it's like, well, we'll just line them all up and shoot them with machine guns. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really sickening. It's appalling. It, and there's a hatred for humanity that's at the bottom of it. And I mean, you can kind of understand why, because we're messy and, you know, we don't clean up after ourselves and, you know, we're like raking the rainforests and that sort of thing. But I do have some sympathy for people because, you know, we're, we're, we're hell on Mother Nature, but she certainly returns the favor. So, <laughs> yes. And that's a good thing to remember. You know, a lot of what we're doing is just bloody well trying to exist with a relative minimum of pain. And we're doing our best to get you know, to get as good at doing that as fast as we can. And that's not an easy thing. There are lots of us and like life is bloody complicated. And the other thing that happens too is again, if you scratch just beneath the surface of people, and this is something that's always, you know, to me has been a kind of miracle is if you talk to someone they're out doing their job and maybe they're doing a good job at it, like some emergency room nurse, you know, Scott, there's a job for you. Or maybe they work in palliative care. You know, and you, you talk to them and you find out they've got like four as I said before, serious problems in their family, and maybe they're diabetic to boot, and yet they haul themselves out of bed in the morning and go take care of dying people. It's like, good God, people deserve a bit of respect for struggling forward and, and not always trying to make the planet a worse place when they're beset on all sides constantly by you know unending series of tragedy. You think we could have a little bit of sympathy for ourselves as a consequence of that. It's like we're not all like rapacious, greedy monsters who are bent on just devouring everything in our path, you know? It's a little bit more complicated than that. So, all right, anyway, so, so, well, so let's go to the next part of this here. Mm -hmm. All right, so, and God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so, and God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. Well, to understand that, because what, how the, that doesn't make any sense at all, really. So uh, I think I told you a little bit about this before. So the, the, the world that's being created in this particular account is a phenomenological world. There's a disk of land. There's, if you go out in the field and you look around, you're on a disk of land. So that's pretty obvious. And then there's a dome on top of it. It's more or less held up by the mountains. And, Rain comes down, so there's water above the dome, because where else would the rain come from? And underneath the ground, there's fresh water. You can drill down and find that. And then around that, there's salt water. And so that's the, the world. And it's kind of an empirical world, because if you're a child and you just go out in the field and you look at the world, that's sort of what it would be like. And so that's the world that's being created. And so one of the things that is worth thinking about, and this is something Carl Jung was very interested in, is that these old descriptions are half 
geographical and half empirical, so sort of based on observation, and half psychological. So one of the things Jung was interested in, for example, was astrology, but mostly for a psychological reason, because you know, there obviously there are stars up on the dome. And then when you look at the stars, you can imagine the shapes of the stars, and that helps you orient yourself, because as soon as you can see shapes in the stars, then you can recognize the constellations and you can orient yourself at night. Yes. But then the constellations become gods, say, and the gods turn into a drama. And so, and the drama comes from within. It's the projection of imagination. And so when Jung was analyzing astrology, he was analyzing psychology because he saw the astrological narrative as the projection of the human imagination onto the cosmos. And so when he was analyzing astrology, he was analyzing psychology. And the, the same thing is the case with these stories is that the world they, they describe is only, it's not the natural world like a scientist would describe it because these right. people weren't scientists. They right. didn't have the technology and the tools. It was it was the way they, it, for, for them, it was the world. For us, it's the way they saw the world. And so we're looking at the way they saw the world and a lot of that psychology. And we share that psychology to a large degree with those people. And this is what reconciled me with um religion uh is is realizing that the the writers of these stories uh, of genesis um that you know this was their world this this is an empirical world one that you see through observation and they were not scientists science is only like 500 years old and human beings haven't really changed in tens of thousands of years so the psychology that comes forth in these stories is the same, even though we have science, you know, Cain and Abel, that kind of thing. We, we can understand those stories. Those stories resonate deeply within us because as, as human beings, we, we don't evolve that quickly. No, no animals evolve that quickly. So that, that's why uh, this stuff is true. You know, um, and this is a battle that I have with fundamentalists all the time. It's like, you know, just be, just because these stories can be, um, quote unquote, disproven scientifically, you know, that the world wasn't created in seven days, doesn't mean that it's not true in a more fundamental sense as it applies elsewhere. Um, you know, as it applies to our psychology, as it applies to our evolution. So, so this is the point at which evolution and the Bible got reconciled for me. And I, and I realized, oh, crap, that idea that I had that this is just all BS and can be disregarded is false. That, that's the wrong idea to have. You know, th this stuff can't be just written off as fairy tales of some sky daddy. That's not what this is about at all. And that's a, that's a very childish way of looking at these stories. It's a very unsophisticated way of looking at these stories. Um, and it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's a resentful way of looking at these stories. And it's, and it's usually coming from a place of justifying our own resentments against religious institutions with which we have interacted in our own lives, you know, um, being judged by the church uh, for your for your lifestyle, or your sexuality, or anything like that. You know, people don't like being judged. Uh, they don't being like told that their very being is wrong, and so that leads them down an atheistic path. You know, where they go, screw religion. It's all BS. And the reason why it's BS is science, but no, really the reason why you, you want it to be BS is because of your own personal feelings. And, and if you're able to set aside your feelings and look at, at these books in a more sophisticated way, look at, you know, and, and forgiving the original authors for not being scientists, you know, oh, I'm sorry, you know, they didn't have telescopes and stuff like that. They, they, they only had that disc world that they lived in and, and weren't able to travel around the world, you know, through satellites and everything else. You know, we can't, we can't apply our morality and, and our way of thinking of things to ancient peoples. We have to take them in their context and, and, and you know, forgive them 
their lack of knowledge that we have now. So, um, hey, Logic Rex is in the house. Awesome. Glad you could join us. Uh, Shaman says, yes, it's part of the sophisticated story of the human condition. Exactly. Exactly. And who the hell was around, you know, when that when this evolution happened? You know, who was around? We can't even pinpoint the moment at which human beings became conscious. But we know it's somewhere around 70,000 years ago, um, as, as far as our, our scientific studies go now, um, because that's when we started creating art. Uh, and uh, the, no other species on the planet creates art. I mean, yeah, sure, you can say that there's art in nesting uh, of the birds and stuff like that, but that's purely a mating thing. They, they're not telling a story. And, and, and the whole idea of storytelling is, is something that is also uniquely human. Um, and so about 70,000 years ago is some of the oldest cave art that we have or that we know of right now. And so we think somewhere around there and a little bit earlier maybe is when human beings actually gained the consciousness that, that we still possess today. So... Uh, that's how, yeah, that, that's what resolved all my issues with Christianity right there, because that was, that was the last stone, the last thing that I needed to, to remove uh, in order to come back to Christianity was, you know, this idea of, of, of the, the stories not being scientific. And it's like, who cares? You know, there's, there's still very, very deep truths in there. And, and uh, you know, Jordan is going to expose those. Uh, and tell them to us, and it's it's wonderful. So let's continue. So in this is psychology, but it's interesting to know what the geographical substrate is, so that you can kind of understand the stories. And I like this picture because that's it's great from a psychological perspective. I've it's had seen this in color; it's beautiful. So basically, what you have here is the world as we know it. And there's the dome with the sun and the moon on it, and the stars. And then, if you look outside, what you know. Well, then you're out into this cosmic space, right? And that's, those are like the wheels of, of the planets and the, the music of the spheres. And that's the ever-present explorer who's gone beyond the domain that he can understand and is peering out into the unknown as such. It's a psychological picture. It's like, because you do know some things and then outside of that, there are things you don't know. And when you're feeling brave, you put a foot or two out where you don't understand. Like, there's frontier everywhere, right? And, if you're if you're feeling heroic and you want to do something for the world and you want to expand what you understand, you poke your head through what you know and you take a look at the at the at whatever structure is out there. And, you know, he's pretty smart because most of them is still where it's safe. And I would say that's a good that's a good thing because if you jump right out there, well, then maybe you fall off the edge of the earth. And I wouldn't precisely recommend that, especially if you do it accidentally. And to me, this is a recreation of the of the Taoist yin yang symbol, you know, with the with the, the the white paisley here, and that's what you know, and the dark paisley serpents really there, and the right place to be is right on the line between them, because you have sort of you've got one foot where you understand that gives you security, and then you know, but it's kind of dull because hey, you know everything that's going on there, and that isn't what people are like. They don't want just security. Dostoevsky said that in Notes from the Underground, a great great book. And, you know, he said, I love this. It was his, uh, an early critic, crit criticism of the notion of a political utopia. He said, look, if you gave people everything they wanted, they had nothing to eat but cake and nothing to do but sit in warm pools and busy themselves with the continuation of the species. That was his, his lines. That the first thing they would do, well, maybe after the first week, was like go kind of half insane and smash everything up just so that something that they didn't expect would happen so that they'd have something interesting to do. Mm -hmm. and it's so right because, you know, the, the utopian notion that if you just had all the material stuff you wanted that you'd, you'd be, well, what would you be? What, what would you do? Would you just sit on the couch and, and watch TV? I mean, you'd, you'd, you'd be, I don't know why you'd be cutting yourself just for entertainment in no time flat, you know, and that's the sort of thing that people do. So we're not adapted for security and utopia. We're adapted for a certain amount of security because, you know, we are vulnerable, but mostly we want to have one foot out where we don't know what the hell is going on because that's where you're alert and alive and tense and with it. 
And, and you know, I think, I believe this, and I believe it actually has something to do with the hemispheric structure of your, of your, of the physiology of your brain is it? Because the right hemisphere looks roughly adapted to what you don't know. And the left hemisphere, and this is a very, this is an oversimplification, but a useful one, is adapted to the world that you do know. And the right place for you to be is halfway between them. Because that, and you can tell that, that's what's so cool. And, and this tells you that this is actually reality that's manifesting itself to you. You know, that sense of active engagement you have in the world when things are working well for you, you know, where you're, where you should be at the right time. You're alert and on top of things and engaged and you don't have much of a sense of time. And the sense of the tragedy of life sort of recedes. And that's when you're, that's when you've got one foot where it's, where it's secure and one foot out in the unknown. And your brain signals to you that you're in the right place by making what you're doing meaningful. This is a state called uh, flow. Um, there's, there's actually been a lot of, uh, of studies about this um, where, uh, you know, artists, um, you know, people are, who are creative and stuff like that. And, and even people in sports, uh, you know, when you, you are competent enough at whatever it is that you're doing that, that you don't have to think about what you're doing, um, at, but you're also doing something that is new, um, you know, pulling off a, a dance routine, things like that. You get a good, you, you memorize the dance routine enough that you can do it. And then you get into this state where time disappears and you're, you're going through the motions fluidly one to the other, you know, because the, the next step is, it, you know, you're moving through into the unknown, but you're doing it competently enough where all time disappears. You know, pain gets reduced in this state of flow. Um, and um, you know, your cares for the world. I mean, if the world disappears and you are there with creation, dancing with creation, painting with creation, doing sports with, cre you just, you can feel it. It is absolutely true that you can feel it. A and it's this state called flow. And so um, let me see if I can find. Um, authors of that book. So uh, yeah, the psychology of optimal experience. Um, it's by Oh, I am not going to be able to pronounce this name. Um, Mikhail Sitsimali. Uh, no, there's no way I can't pronounce this name, but I'll, I'll put a. Um, oh, come on. Let me let me call it, copy this. There we go. Um, I'll put this in the chat. So. This is the name of the author. Um, geez, I, I wouldn't even know how to spell that. But um, that the, the book is called Flow, and it's the psychology of optimal experience. So yeah, this is this is what Jordan Peterson is talking about with being balanced between your left and right hemisphere. Um, and, and EMDR uses this with bilateral stimulation. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it it's an absolutely fascinating thing that our brains do uh, when we are we are perfectly balanced between order and chaos. So, and that sense of meaning is actually a neurophysiological signal that you've got the forces of the cosmos properly balanced in your being at that moment, and that's why it feels so good. And then yep. what else could it possibly be? I mean. You know, our, our, our brain is capable of looking beyond our vision. That's what it's for. And that sense of engagement, there's no reason to assume that that's anything but a real signal. And you can reduce it. You could say, well, the problem with being where you know only is that you don't know everything. And that's going to be a problem in the future. And the problem with being where you know nothing is <laughs> that's just too much, man. Like, you know, you go into panic mode and because anything can happen there and you can't handle it. Yep. So you've got to mediate between those two things. You want to be secure enough so that your physiology isn't revving out of control. And you want to be out there in the unknown enough so that you keep updating yourself constantly, constantly, constantly. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the place where information flow is maximized. And you know that because that's where you are when you're having a really interesting conversation with someone where you're gripped by a book 
or you're really into a movie or maybe something that you do as a, you know, you know, apart from your work or maybe even in your work, you're into it. And that's because you are in the right place at the right time. And your whole nervous system is signaling that to you. Yep. And I would say that's the sort of place that you should be all the time. And of course, you can't be because no one's perfect, but it's that's that's the recreation of paradise on earth. It's something like it because you are in the right place at the right time when that is happening, subject to certain, what would you say, restrictions that, that we can talk about later. Well, that's what this guy's doing. And, and that's, I would say, akin to the action that God is taking when he's transforming the chaos of potential into habitable being. And it's the sort of thing that human beings are supposed to act out. Uh, let me go s see if I can find the other A Cure of the Dawn song, because there, there's a song that he does on this that is absolutely wonderful that I'd, I'd love to share with you guys. So, um, do, 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 do. Uh. Use the um let's see uh Jordan Peterson let's see if they'll find it. Is this it? No, I don't think that's it. Uh, it's um, let me see. I think it's from 12 Rules for Life. I'm not sure. If anybody in the chat knows, uh, put it up. Let me share this other screen with you guys. Um, and we'll see, share. All right. It's in the 12 rules for life. Let me, let me look up the song because I, I purchased that whole album. Um, and it's just, it's just so good. So, Ah, that's what it is. Um, there we go. Search. Give me the song. All right. I believe this is it, so bear with me. Yes. Meaning is what you have to buttress yourself against the tragedy of life. Despite the fact that you're a fragile, damaged, mortal creature, you found something to do that announced itself as worthwhile. That's meaning. It's an instinct. It's a deep, deep instinct. It's maybe the deepest instinct. It's like a form of vision. Meaning tells you when you're in the right place. And the right place is between chaos and order. And those are real places. Your hemispheres. Your right hemispheres roughly evolve, let's say, to deal with things you don't understand. That's chaos. And your left is there to deal with things you do understand. You can't just stay with the things you do understand because you already understand them. You can't just stay with what you don't understand because then you're not. And you need to be in the middle of those two. And you can tell when you're in the middle because everything lines up. Because everything lines up. is you do the thing that gets you off the hook the fastest right now. 
You play that game across time, it doesn't work. It sends you down. Because you're sacrificing the future for the present. Meaning doesn't do that. Meaning says, I'm here where I should be. And you can't tell why, it's just that everything is right. You get this physiological sense. Right place, right time. Follow this meaningful path. That's your buttress against the tragedy that produces resentment and malevolence. Meaning is the antidote to that. That's the fundamental religious truth. Life is suffering. That's true. There's no evidence. That's true. Meaning is the antidote to that. Yes. People say, well, meaning is real. It's like, no, that's wrong. It's actually the most real thing. It might even be more real than suffering and evil. Yes. It's possible. This isn't a metaphysical assumption that I make. It. And you do feel it. It's, you feel it in your body. It's not just a, a mental thing. It's not an idea. Yeah. It's a place. Because we're in time and space, right? And a place is a place. You know, three dimensions of space, but it's also a time. And the place and the time are set up properly. You're in the right place. And your brain is telling you that. Your being is telling you that. The purpose of profound religious contemplation, profound philosophical contemplation, is to learn how to be in the right place at the right time, all the time. this line from the Gospel of Thomas, which was discovered in like 1957, and it says, the kingdom of God is spread out before the eyes of men, but men do not see it. And that's kind of what it's referring to. There are times when you're in the right place at the right time, and then you're where you should be, and you're not really trained to notice that, because it isn't something we ever talk about. It's like, you're in the right place at the right time. Okay, why? What did I do right? What did I do? I need to do more of that. So maybe it's only half an hour a week when you first start noticing. And then maybe with three months of practice, you can get it up to like an hour a day. And then maybe you can get it up to four hours a day. And God only knows where you could get it if you if you keep practicing, you know. You, you, can, you can be there. We don't know what the upper limit of that is. So, yeah, I love that song. That's That's also chapter seven of Jordan Peterson's um, 12 Ru Rules for Life, Pursue What is Meaningful. Um, and you, know, you hear in the song, he's talking about profound religious experience. You know, that this is, you know, entering into flow um, is a very profound religious experience. Um, it, and, and religious experience doesn't have to be, you know, Judeo-Christian at that point. That's, you know, this... This happens in other religions as well, where they talk about that 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 Zen state um, that that's trying to describe this um, you know, Nirvana, that kind of thing. Um, so it's uh, that that and it is we are in the image of God at that moment, being creative. Uh, you know, whatever it is that we're involved in. Um, it's that that flow, that optimal psychological state, and and in that moment we are creating. Um, you know, we're 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 taking chaos and making it into order, um, and, but right on that edge, right on that edge. So, um, and uh, so yeah, let's let's go back to the uh, biblical series. Where was that? Share. And then I got to go over and press play. And God said, let the waters under heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seeds. And God saw that it was good. Well, that's an interesting thing, too, because, you know, there's this there's this play written by a German named Goethe. I can never say it. I love Goethe. Johann G-O-E-T-H-E, and I can't say it. But he did. He wrote did. this play called Faust. 
he wrote one part of it when he was quite young, and then Faust too when he was quite old. And he has a character in there, Mephistopheles, and Mephistopheles is the devil. And he actually has the devil explain himself twice, basically using the same words, which, which I really like. It was very profound. And basically, Goethe's Mephistopheles says, you know, he's the adversary of the word. That's a good way of putting it. Um, that's the idea that that's the really love, it's really he's the figure yeah. behind the snake in the Garden of Eden, which is right. something we'll talk about more. But he has a he has a sophisticated philosophy. He's not just some random troublemaker. He he's got a he's got a deep philosophy, and his philosophy is quite straightforward. And it's compelling. It's compelling. And and people are gripped by it quite often, far more often than they think. His philosophy is, well, look around at the world. It's like Ivan Karamazov in the Brothers Karamazov. Um, he's trying to disabuse his younger brother of being a, a, a Christian monk. Mephistopheles says, well, look at the world. I mean, all you look around the world, it's nothing but a bloodbath. It's just suffering everywhere. Everything eats everything, and people die terribly, and, and they're cruel to one another, and the whole mess is nothing but a, a constant haul of terrible carnage and, and ruin and, 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 and wreck. He says it would be better if it was never existed at all. And that's a very interesting, that's a very, very interesting idea. And I do believe, and I've seen this in people many times, that in the depths of despair, especially when you've been betrayed, for example, and you wander into the wrong subdivision of the underworld, that's something that comes to mind. If you know you have a very sick child, for example, or maybe your whole family is suffering, as whole families do sometimes, an idea is going to come to you. It's like, good God, who put this mess together? And yeah. is it really worth it? Is it really worth the suffering? Yeah. Suicidal people, you know, they say no. They say, no, enough of this. You know, and you have to be pushed a long way, generally speaking, before you'll actually commit suicide. You have to be in very, very desperate straits. But your yeah. answer under those conditions is that being is such that it would be better if it had never been. And that's a very... I think I think it's a very it's a terrible philosophy, I believe, because I think what happens if you act it out is that you make the very things that led you to despair far worse. Yes. And I can't see that if it's reasonable to draw a logical conclusion that suffering should justify your desire to make being end, that the answer to that can't be to produce more suffering. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And my observation has been that people who act out the Mephistophelian philosophy inevitably make suffering far worse. And so, and then that raises the other specter of, well, do they want being just to cease or are they just out for bloody revenge at every, at any cost? And my conclusion has always been that, is that the mask is, well, being shouldn't exist because it's too terrible, but the true motivation is I'm going to make everyone suffer as much as I possibly can before I say goodbye to this place. And if you read the writings of people like the kids who showed up to Columbine High School, they'll tell you exactly that that's precisely and exactly what they concluded and then acted out. So anyways, but in this, God says that it was good. And I thought about that a lot. It's like, because the question is something like, well, is, is something better than nothing? All right, we're going to end it there because we've only got like seven minutes left. Um, unless I, I, I don't know where he concludes this thought and I don't want to get too deep into it um, because I do want to talk about um, the idea of, you know, suffering being overwhelming to the point where people do commit suicide. Uh, and, you know, it's, you do have to be pushed to dire straits to reach that point. Um, and yeah, I, I've, I've dealt with people who've been suicidal before and there are generally three things, four things that you want to do. Uh, first off, get them out of the house. Uh, because if you're, if you're trapped in four walls for too long, you know, it, it really starts to mess with your mind. And, that, and that's one of the reasons why these lockdowns really concern me. Uh, cause it's, it's not psychologically good. Uh, the second thing is, is you get them moving. Um, you know, because for some reason, you know, we're, we're walking creatures. And, he, and even if the person can't walk, you know, put them in a car and drive, um, you know, talk to them uh, and, and give them food. And those are the four things that you want to do if you're dealing with somebody who is suicidal, um, you know, especially if you can get somebody who's a good friend, if you're not the good friend, um, you know, get them out of the house, get them moving, 
get them food um, and talk, you know, cause it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's situational and, and, you know, life is suffering, you know, life is, is amazing suffering. Uh, and, and, but we do have the tools to buttress ourselves against that suffering. Um, and it's one of those things where, you know, sometimes that that's very hard to do. Uh, you know, you're, you're too poor, you're, you're in too poor health. Um, you, you have things outside of your control that are going on. Um, you know, somebody else committed suicide recently, that sort of thing. Uh, something that you can't control, can't change, you know, feeling helpless, feeling out there in chaos, uh, and, and that chaos and suffering hurting so much that you're just like, no, no, I'm done. Um, uh, yeah, shaman, uh, in Buddhism, suffering is one of the four noble truths. Exactly. Suffering exists. Um, and yeah, however, in the four noble truths is that suffering can end. Um, and, and you want that end to be something better, not something worse, you know? Um, and it's, it's, if you can get into that position where you are able to get into flow, you know, where, where you have enough stability in your life that then you can take on a little bit of chaos and find that edge between the two of them, you know, and ride it, you know, that gives us a, a sense of meaning. And it really is, and Jordan Peterson talks about this a lot, meaning is the fundamental truth that buttresses us against pain and suffering. You know, if, if the pain and suffering is nothing but pain and suffering and has no value to it, that drags us down. But if the pain and suffering has value, if it if it's giving you know life to something else, like people who go through boot camp, that's a lot of suffering. You know, people who go through SEAL training, through uh, training to to work on oil rigs and stuff like that, that's a lot of suffering. But if you have meaning behind it, if it's if it's suffering for a purpose, suffering for a cause, suffering for something like that, um, you know, childbirth is suffering. You know, but there's so much meaning in bringing forth a new life into the world that it transforms the suffering into something else, as in, into something that we will willingly undergo in order to have that, that meaning, that new thing that's created as a result of it. You know, whether it's a new you from going through boot camp and being able to serve your country, you know, and, and the suffering and the meaning don't have to happen at the same time. Like um, I've discovered in dealing with my chronic pain, uh, you know, what I'm doing to help other people who are in chronic pain and suffering, you know, if I can lift, if my suffering and my pain can lift you out of your suffering and your pain, you know, whether or not I'm, I'm actually able to resolve that pain, that doesn't matter. It may be a heart pain. It may be a mental pain, a spiritual pain, something like that. If I'm able to, if my suffering can help your suffering in that way, then my suffering takes on meaning. You know, my, my understanding of what that suffering is like allows me to communicate with you in a way that others can't. You know, they have no idea what you're going through. But because I've had the same pain, I know what you're going through and I can be there for you and I can help you. And then that, you know, resolves my suffering and pain because now it has value. I was able to help somebody else with it. I was able to make a tool out of it. And, and I mean, that's something that's absolutely beautiful, uh, being able to, to transform suffering and pain into something that is noble and has meaning and value. Um, so uh, I guess we've got two minutes left. I went on a little bit of a spiel there. Um, but uh, does anybody have anything else to add? Um, you know, I'm just, I'm so glad that everybody's here tonight. This is so much fun for me. And I, I love going through it with you guys. Um, and uh, I know my mom is watching right now. So hi, mom. <laughs> She's been sending me little texts. And there was, there was one point in there uh, that I took a note. So if I, if I seem distracted, I'm still listening because I've also watched these a couple of times. Um, but yeah. I've been getting feedback from mom and, and I did you warmed my heart. <laughs> um, yes, shaman suffering can be, and is often part of the hero's journey. I think it's a necessary part of the hero's journey. 
You know, the hero can't transform into a hero without going through suffering. I mean, we, we see that in Star Wars, where what is it that launches Luke Skywalker into, you know, becoming a Jedi? Well, his uncle and aunt were torched. You know, the whole farm was destroyed. And that pain and suffering put him on the path, you know, to, to do something better and be that hero. So, yeah, um, you know, even though pain and suffering is awful, we can transform it into something magnificent. And I think that is the, the biggest gift from God in the world is, is our ability to do that. So, um, but anyway, Shaman's going to get the last word on that. And um, it is seven o'clock. So uh, I'm going to let you all go. And um, yeah, this was, this was a lot of fun tonight. So uh, next week, same time, um, uh, go ahead and don't forget to smash the like, uh, share this out so other people can watch it. And uh, we'll be back on next Friday, five o'clock to do uh, the 12 rules for life. And then we'll continue with this uh, series on Saturday. So um, <laughs> Shaman says, great show tonight. Well done, Pam. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. So yeah, glad you all were here. And with that, I'm going to sign off. Good night. Mm -hmm.